that is our responsibility. Um, because the last thing we want is so many of the great discoveries of history and the people who did them to be memory hold away. As I sit here recording this today, it is Memorial Day 2024, where we remember the many fallen heroes um, in the United States who, through their great sacrifices, uh, allows us allowed us to live in the country that we live in. And, and so, of course, we have that. But of course, it's Memorial Day. And the root of the word memorial is, of course, the word memory, when you get into the entomology of it. Memory, both good and bad memories, as it were, just because it is the word memory. It could be good or bad. It could or it could just be a memory. You have that kind of thing going on. But I, it came back to mind again today, and the reason it did was I happened to be watching uh, The Reason We Learn earlier tonight as of this recording and um, Deb Philman's Dissident Dispatch on The Reason We Learn, um, where she was actually talking about the memory holding of American history. And, you know, I wanted to go back, come back to that and to ask a question at the end of this related to this channel's topic, of course, about science specifically um but also because i what i that this is something that i have been harping on for ages and ages and ages at this point that one of the great failures and i'm gonna be harsh and say it one of the great failures of stem education um science education generally in the last few years has been failing to teach history of science, but also philosophy of science and why it's a good thing. And it goes back to teaching a little bit about Western history um, also and, in, and the Enlightenment and things like that um, and carefully teaching them. And the lack of teaching that has left us with some of the problems that we have now uh, with more activists than scientists involved. Apologies, I think the cat is up to trouble. Um, <laughs> So we'll find out in a moment if something crashes, right? Um, <clears throat> and so I wanted to come back to that. And when I started looking around just for something to talk off of, I came across this article from Boston University. It's from 2016, but why scientists need history lessons um, by Mohammed Zaman uh, at Boston University. Lately, there's been a lot of discussion highlighting the need for incorporating social sciences in STEM. I would argue just history, not social sciences. Just history, thank you. Disciplines in order to foster creativity, increase empathy, and create a better understanding of the human condition among scientists. Unfortunately, all this talk hasn't changed the reality on the ground. As a teacher and researcher in biomedical engineering, looking at the fundamental functions of the human body, I feel that we in engineering, as well as other sciences, have done a disservice to our students. We have failed to connect them through the history to the history of science through stories of scientists. Well, you don't just need stories of scientists, you need stories of things that happened. And I will give you a good example of why one of the things that's prompted so much of the research around climate has been understanding how the hell the Ice Age happened <laughs> or how the hell Ice Ages have happened in the past. So it's not just stories of scientists, individuals per se, but it is stories of events, as it were, and things that happened. Our students these days have little knowledge about the giants on whose shoulders we stand. Oh my God, yes. I would agree with this. So much of the history of science that I have learned was not in my entirety of college, undergraduate and graduate school, I did not learn nearly as much as when I got out and started reading on my own. That, that's why I'm just like, what the hell are we doing? <laughs> we do need to teach some of these things. And yet there is strong evidence that students are more likely to develop an interest in science and pursue science education when engaged through narratives that tell a story. Now, narratives I don't like. Because what is science about? The pursuit of the truth. So you should be talking about the true things in history, not the narratives, not narratives, true things. Research also shows that such stories enable students in STEM disciplines to better understand and apply their classroom knowledge in real world settings. In one of my engineering classes, I discuss how fluids such as air and blood flow in the human body. 
These processes are critical to our health and well-being. As I do that, I also discuss the associated discoveries made by leading scientists. The seminal work of su scientists such as Joseph Fourier, Fourier, Daniel Bernoulli, and Isaac Newton, Bernoulli rather, and Isaac Newton has transformed our world and tremendously improved our quality of life. This is one of the reasons why you should tell the history of science. Because, yes, it does have its dark passages. And as I've talked about before, a lot of those dark passages are because ideology, ideological leanings became prefer preferred over science by the scientist, as it were. Um, <laughs> but it's also provided such tremendous good things in our lives. Fact matter, we couldn't have this conversation right now on a YouTube if it were not for science. Or rather, I should say, scientific studies, scientific research, because science is, of course, a process. Anyway. <clears throat> However, beyond the most famous anecdote about the falling apple leading to the discovery of gravity, I found that students in my class knew little about Newton's contributions. While students in my class may have a rich understanding of the Fourier transform, a fundamental mathematical relationship that forms the basis of modern electrical engineering, they literally know nothing about who Fourier was. Research suggests that context and history play a strong role in connecting science and engineering theory with practice. But despite studies highlighting the importance of storytelling and historical case study approaches, impersonal PowerPoint presentations dominate classrooms. Historical perspectives and rich stories are missing in such presentations. Now, I, don't get me wrong. I, I do agree with the fact that there's so many technical presentations are horrible because they can't be engaging and it's like deadpan talking like robot that kind of thing but again i hesitate at narrative and story and the reason why is because it's easy to manipulate to an activist event when science is about the process of science and the discipline of science about the pursuit of the truth why it matters as educators we face tremendous pressures to pack technical materials into our courses so why should we include history in our lesson plans? First, history provides a compelling perspective on the process of scientific discovery. We have known through research that historical references can help students clear up common misconceptions about scientific topics, ranging from planetary motion to evolution. Looking at the story of science over centuries enables students to understand that research and discovery are continuous processes. Indeed, continuous refinement <laughs> involved. You need the philosophical philosophical part of it. Don't get me wrong. You need that in there too. But anyway, they can also, they can then see that the laws and the equations that they use to solve problems were discovered through long and sometimes painful processes. You will also find actually, if you're looking at some of this history is they'll posit something, but they don't have the technological ability to be able to test it at the time. So it the, so the answer to the question and then, you know, the confirmation of something somebody posited hundreds of years ago may get confirmed farther down the line just because somebody finds the technological ability to be able to do it. The findings they arrive at today, in other words, are the fruits of the hard work of real people who lived in real societies and had complex lives just like the rest of us. Second, a sense of history teaches students that, that the all-important value of failure in science. You fail a lot. You try and fail a lot if you're a scientist. You really do. It also highlights the persistence of scientists who continue to push the, uh, against the odds. Recent research suggests that by discussing the struggles and failures of scientists, teachers are able to motivate students. Indeed, the discussion of struggles, obstacles, failures, and persistence can lead to significant academic improvement of students, particularly for those who may be facing personal or financial difficulties or feel discouraged by previous instructors or mentors. Yeah, I, I'd be curious to read the study about that myself, but anyway. <clears throat> This dose of inspiration is particularly valuable for STEM students who face barriers in their academic work. Oh, great. Um, the stories of past scientists are a reminder to them that history is an opportunity. Not all great discoveries were made by people at the very top of the socioeconomic pyramid. This is actually very true. One of the sort of postmodern narratives that comes with the underlining, you know, postmodern narratives that have been allowed to seep in is that, you know, it's the powerful people. It's only done by powerful people. That's never been true. Um, and indeed, so many of the different things that give us our greatest breakthroughs are done by the folks who are outside, um, who, who are not necessarily the most powerful within a discipline, let's say. And actually, this is a good example. 
so the book I have here is uh, The S Discovery of Global Warming by Spencer Weert. He is a uh, science historian, wrote the book, and basically walks through all the different uh, discoveries that lead us to how we talk about climate change and a lot of things now. Again, not necessarily the activist version of it is what I mean with, by that, but all those kind of major discoveries that we learned about. And one of the key things you find in this book, actually, is that so many of the scientific breakthroughs that led to how we talk about uh, climate and climate change today, at least in sort, of, in sort of the research side, I'm not talking about the political activist side, um, comes from, came from folks who were not climatologists, came from folks who were completely outside the discipline of climatology, but were interested, again, in the primary question of how the hell did ice ages happen? <laughs> That's what they were very interested in at the time. And there wasn't the notion of, you know, humans can alter their environment, um, or humans can have an influence on the atmosphere and the climate. There wasn't any of that um, at those times. But it was through the other question, answering the other question about, you know, how, could, how the hell could the ice age happen, that we also built the building blocks to realize that, oh yeah, humans could actually have a pretty profound impact on the climate. So there you go. Connected to the process of discovery and innovation is the fundamental notion of an interdisciplinary approach. Um, the goal in the end is not to compromise on the rigor or to focus exclusively on history and personalities, but to make the material more accessible through storytelling and connection with our common heritage. Again, I don't like storytelling in this. Truth-telling of the events and what have you, yes. Storytelling, no. By making students realize that they are part of a grand tradition of learning, success, and failure, we might find that the goals of retention, inspiration, access, and rich engagement with the material are closer than we realize. So again, this is I've I've harped on this before, but it was one of the reasons why I, one of the greatest failures I can see in how STEM education has been done in the last 20, 30 years has been not teaching little bits of history, not teaching the good of scientific history, all the amazing things that came up with it, but also not teaching the philosoph philosophical side of it, the philosophy of science, like the Bertonian norms and things like that. Why didn't you teach them? You know, that kind of thing, particularly the, particularly norms like commun the four norms, communality, universalism, disinterestedness, organized skepticism. Those are the four Bertonian norms uh, that basically give us a lot of what goes on in science at this point. Um, normative principles of scientific practice and all the like there. Um, but that's not taught. It was like I said, I didn't learn half as much about it. Didn't learn, I learned very, very, very little about any of that, scientific history, anything like that, from graduate, from undergraduate and graduate school. Very, very little. Very, very little. Now, to be fair, with certain disciplines, yes, I did, obviously. Um, but not just in sort of general, generic sense. Obviously, I know a lot of history with my own specific discipline but um, of science, but learned a lot more about the rest of it <laughs> well outside of college, let's put it that way. Um, whether just on my own time when I was in undergrad or, as is the case a lot more recently, um, in the last few years uh, since I finished graduate school in 2016 myself. So this is important to know. And one of the reasons I wanted to bring this up is from something that Deb said during her live. Um, so I want you to um, have a look at this um, <clears throat> and listen here to what she has to say, because she has a very good question that if you are a STEM professional, in particular, or you are a scientist, or you're a science student, I want you to listen to this question and think about it specifically, the question that Deb's going to ask, because she says it much more eloquently than I could. Um, I want you to listen to this question and then think about it with respect to science. And I'm going to come back and comment on the other side. Losing everything, brain damage, dying. I mean, by the way, right before this, she's talking a little bit about, about World War II, because this was her World War II and World War I, because this was her... Um, Memorial Day stream also, so pardon pardon that for a moment. And it's easy for us to sit here at home on a day like this and, and talk about the evil politicians and they shouldn't have sent there and we had no business being- That's not the right spot. <laughs> Hang on. 
about it in Princess Bride, for goodness sake. Um, but that's just another piece of history. It was, we're here to talk about history. If we really learned from history, would we do some of these things? Would we fight some of these wars? Would we go off on these adventures? Every war is a miscalculation if you start it. To Deb's point, think about that with respect to science. If we're really teaching our students history, scientific history, and how they stand on the shoulders of giants, you know, would they repeat some of the failures, repeat some of the problems? Would they have learned something from it that would be to their benefit? If you're responding, if you're defending yourself, that's, I mean, you got to do what you got to do. But if you start a war, which we did in Afghanistan and we did in Iraq, where the hell is it? We just might save a few million lives. Um, so with that, all that said, um, I think I finally found it. Sorry about that. I want to start. I'm trying to think of the best place to start with this because the question I want to ask of you audience is who owns our memory? Now I'm not talking about Deb's memory or Ethan's or Jess's or you know, Adrian's or anybody's memory. I'm talking about our, as a, as a culture, Western culture, and then more narrowly America, the United States of America, who, who owns the, the memory, the history of that. And it might seem like a strange question. Like, what do you mean? Who owns it? Well, who owns it is, in my opinion, important because if we don't personally take ownership of it in terms of how important it is to us, if we rely on teachers, universities, politicians, NGOs, other people to decide what's important to know, what's important to hold on to and carry forth, what's important to teach to our children, what's important to repeat to ourselves and amongst ourselves, What's important to amplify when it appears that somebody's forgotten or just, you know, not really repeating it accurately or fully? Who, who owns that? And I think it's more important than ever because we have AI now. Where So I'm, I might like to go a little bit longer here, but um, therein lies the question that I would ask, knowing that, frankly, we haven't done a great job as scientists in Brit Large, and I'm going to include myself in this because I've been around long enough, right? Um, and all those kinds of things to teach our own history of science. We really haven't done a great job of it. Um, I don't think, I think we've done a pretty shitty job, <laughs> to be honest. Or we might have students who are less inclined to be activists. And in fact, matter, there's another piece. I may do another video on this, but it came out. I was amazed it was published in a nature journal. I think a lot of people were of a comment piece talking about the concern of climate activism and climate science and activists masquerading as scientists or scientists turning into activists. And what would that do to the credibility and what have you when you're trying to, to deal with climate science? And I wonder, would we have the problem with serious activists in science if we were teaching our activists masquerading as scientists, rather, if we were teaching our own history um, or if scientists were involved in some way in teaching their own history um, and understanding their own history themselves? I, I wonder that. And so that's to, to ask the question um, in another way that Deb just asked, um, who owns the memory of science? Who owns the memory of scientific history? Well, who, who curates, there we go. Who curates scientific history? Who owns it? Um, who owns that memory? And I know I commented on Deb's thing just for in general history that, well, ideally, it's all of us, right? It's all of us who own that, who have some collect, who have some, not necessarily collective, but who have knowledge of it in the fundamentals and the most important things and are interested in it, relevant, what have you. But is that really what's happening with respect to science, to STEM? And I ask this question because I haven't seen yet a survey done of, professors, 
graduate students, postdocs, undergraduate students who are interested in STEM disciplines. I haven't seen a survey done that gauges how much scientific history these students know. It would be a fascinating survey to see. To be honest, it would be extremely fascinating. But I do I have not seen it. And so I'm wondering this, and I'm also wondering this because Deb goes on to talk about it, the concerns about everything going digital. Well, easy to manipulate digital as opposed to a paper copy. Hence the reason, paper books. But who owns that memory of science? If I'm operating under the communality principle of Mertonian norms, then it belongs, communality is scientific knowledge belongs to everyone. Okay. But is that true also of scientific history, of the events that lead us to all of that knowledge that we've gained, technological advances, all of those things? Who owns that part of it is a different question, I think. And I would like to say, ideally, that it's everybody. But I also know that that's not easy for everybody either, though you should know quite a great deal of the basics. And particularly if you're a student going into a STEM field, you better damn well know certain things, right? Um, in history, you better damn well know certain things of philosophy also. But who owns that memory? And I can't say for sure. This is why, when I, this is why I brought up Dead's question and why I'm asking it myself, because I can't say for sure who does right now. Um, it's certainly possible, of course, of the ironies of STEM and technology and what have you. You've got your phone, you've got your internet, you can go look up whatever you'd like on a daily basis. At a moment's notice, find something, hopefully factual, um, and look at it that way. But, you know, that's also the internet changes in the blink of an eye. As it were, it's not necessarily the most stable thing for a, for a place to go look something up. Um, and Deb doesn't just mean this, and she goes on to say it, but she doesn't just mean this in terms of factual things, events and what have you, but also values. And again, this is why I come back to scientific philosophy and the Mertonian norms and what have you. So who owns all of that? Well, one could say that it is the responsibility and role of the academics, the current scientists, the senior scientists of our generation to transmit that history to the next generation, to own that history and to share it. And I do think that that is the current problem right now, that, you know, that it hasn't happened, and that's unfortunately led to an awful lot of activists in science. And again, I don't think social sciences is the right thing, but history for sure. Um, and so, you know, what what do we do with this going forward? And I argue, and I continue to argue, that if we are to have the continuity of our disciplines and the respect for things like merit, uh, Object, objective reality being an important thing, trying to figure out what the truth is, that the truth does actually matter, um, and all of those kinds of things that make science as the process that it is fabulous and such an engine for the improvement and the quality of life of society that's happened over time has been in part because of science's incredible pursuit of the truth in a reality-based community that is collective. It is collective, don't get me wrong. It's not just one person, because why? Because one person can make a discovery and then somebody else has got to go make it, you know, go check that and see, oh, hey, I got the same thing. Oh, I got the same thing. No, I found something different. That kind of thing, because it is, you know, approaching it from different bio different perspectives, very different perspectives and looking at something and, you know, you move collectively closer and closer to what the truth is, right? Um, that's why it still is something of a collective enterprise, even though you are doing it as individuals oftentimes are in teams. But that kind of thing, that understanding of that history and how important that is and that it doesn't necessarily matter what the background is, 
with a person, they can make a very interesting development happen with research, um, with the with the use of the scientific method. And of course, how did the scientific method develop? That's a key part of scientific history, yeah. Modern scientific method, anyway. But who owns that information and who's transmitting it? Well, we would say, you know, who owns it? We all do. If I'm going by communality, that's the natural response. Who, who, to who owns it? But, well, who's responsible for transmitting that to the next generation? Senior scientists, scientists like myself um, and others, are they responsible for transmitting it? Why is it also good the way science is done? You know, the philosophy of science, the values behind it, Martonian norms, all that kind of stuff. That is our responsibility. Um, because the last thing we want is so many of the great discoveries of history and the people who did them to be memory holed away because it's inconvenient or it's offensive. That doesn't help because if science is about the pursuit of the truth, well, you can't just memory hole something then. That's hiding something that may be very true or likely is very true when you're talking about events in the past. So that's just what I wanted to rant on for a little bit <laughs> with my thoughts. And I hope if you're a STEM professional who's watching this, I'd like you to answer that question for me in the comments below this video. Who owns the memory of um, science? Who, oh, who is that, who's got curation of that history? And who's responsible for passing it on to the next generation? Comment down below. I'd be curious to know your responses, particularly if you are a STEM uh, professional or a social science professor yourself. Um, I'd be very curious to hear it. Uh, until next time, I'm Adrian. May you stay curious.